Good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing today? Great. Like two people. But that's cool. Um, I feel like that's the standing joke that pastors do. Hey, they're just like, how's everyone doing? Two people say hi, and they're just like, two people are doing great. It's like every sermon. It's fine. Um, so we are going to be continuing on in our series in the Gospel of John. Um, last week, Ben talked about John chapter 6, so this week we are going to be doing John chapter 7. Uh, just for those of you who haven't actually been here for any of the other ones, or maybe you saw only a couple of them, we aren't going to be doing every single detail of each chapter. Um, we will be kind of giving some context, going over some of the stuff, and then digging into uh, certain parts of it. Basically, what we are doing as a team is we're reading through the chapters and we're picking out things that we feel like would be really good to talk about from those chapters. So if you guys um, are a part of the series, make sure that you're going and reading through the chapter yourself. Like if, if you haven't already read John chapter 7 or if it's been a while, just give it a read because um, it will help you understand a little bit more about what's going on because we just don't have time to go through every single part of the chapter. Um, but it is going to be good. So we're going to be doing a little recap of the first few verses of John chapter 7, and then we will go into a little bit more detail. Um, what's going on in this section of John is there is a feast that's going on. Um, some of you guys might know there's a lot of different festivals and feasts that the Israelite people celebrated every year. It's kind of like our holidays, right? Like celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Easter. We have these like almost like benchmarks and we do these things kind of every year ritualistically. It was similar in that culture, but this was called the Festival of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Um, some of you guys might have heard about that. It is where the Israelite people would remember the time when they were traveling in the wilderness from Egypt to the Promised Land. They were living in the desert for a very long time, God was taking care of them. He was very faithful to provide food and water and shelter and protection for his people during that time. And so during the Feast of Booths, the Israelite people would remember that time. They would remember the time when they didn't have anything. They couldn't provide for themselves in any way, and God was faithful and he provided. So they would travel to Jerusalem, which was kind of like their capital city in a way, and they would travel there where they would build these outdoor shelters and live in them for one week. And that was how they kind of remembered that time. So they would kind of leave their like nice homes that they had built for themselves in different cities. They would travel to Jerusalem and they would live outside in these homemade shelters. And then they would, you know, go into the temple. There would be teachings that would happen and they would remember the time when God took care of them, when he was faithful to care for his people. So that's kind of the time when this was happening. And Jesus' brothers come to him. These are Mary and Joseph's sons. And so they came and they were like, Jesus, uh, you should come with us to this festival and you should make this grand entrance, right? Like you're, you're saying you're the Messiah, that you're the coming savior. Like show yourself to the people. Show who you are. We want this big kind of like grand showy appearance, right? And Jesus is basically saying, no, um, that's not what I'm going to do here. Uh, the Israelites had been waiting for a very long time for a, a savior or a Messiah. So um, if you guys haven't kind of read through it, um, there was a, all these prophecies in the Old Testament that the Israelite people would know that talked about this savior who was going to come and who was going to save them from all this oppression, all these problems that they would have. And so the Israelite people were constantly waiting for, it's called the Messiah. They called it the Messiah. And Jesus is, I'm the Messiah, right? He's like, I've come, I'm here. And so it's not that his brothers were impatient for him to show himself. It actually says in John 7 uh, verse 5 that his brothers didn't even believe in him, right? And so it's almost like they're kind of goading Jesus on here. They're like, if you're the Messiah, like if you're really who you say you are, if you're the Savior, why don't you just make this big entrance into Jerusalem? Why don't you just show everybody that you're the Messiah? And then Jesus responds in John 7, 6 and 7. He says, my time has not come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. So kind of what's going on here is Jesus is saying, you're, you're not really coming up against anything culturally. You're not trying to fight against the status quo. You're not trying to change anything here right? The world doesn't hate you because you're for it. You're doing exactly what the world is doing. 
But Jesus, on the other hand, actually came to do the opposite. So he came to stir things up a little bit. He came to confront some of the things that had been happening for a long time. Uh, They aren't there to stir anything up. The world doesn't hate them because they're not confronting the world's problems. So I titled my message today, Stirring Up the Waters. And if you guys have seen the series, The Chosen, it's really good. Um, There's one part of the series where the actor who plays Jesus has just healed someone on the Sabbath. That is considered to be like a big no-no in that culture. Um, And he says after he heals this person, he says, sometimes you have to stir up the waters. And what he means by that is sometimes you have to shift people's way of thinking. We've gotten into patterns sometimes of things that we do over and over and over and over again to the point where we think this is the only way to do it, and it's not even actually scriptural. And so Jesus was there to stir up the waters a little bit, um, and he's there to shake things up. He, I call him kind of like the mo- he was like a rebel in that day because everybody in that day did things a certain way, and Jesus was like, but this wasn't the way that I wanted it to be. So he came in, he was like, almost like if you've seen The Chosen, there's actually a really cool visual. There's a whole school of fish that are swimming in the same direction, and then one fish starts going in the opposite direction, and then some start following it. That's what Jesus is here to do. So he tells his brothers, I'm not going to the Feast of Booths with you. You guys go ahead. You can make your grand entrance if that's what you want to do. That's not what I'm here to do. He doesn't want the publicity, like the unwelcome attention at this point. He knows he's done some stuff already that has made some enemies within that kind of like the, especially the religious leaders of that day. And he's like, I'm not going to do that. That's not my time yet. He knew it wasn't his time to be surrendered to them. And so he's not going to make a big scene coming into Jerusalem. He's not afraid of his enemies, but he knows that God's timing is perfect. So instead of making a grand entrance, it says that he goes secretly into Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of booths. So um, about halfway through the feast, Jesus goes into the temple where there's this huge crowd of people, um, and they're all there to kind of do some learning about what's going on and different things. And Jesus stands up and starts to preach, teach boldly to this crowd of people. And so that's kind of our recap of what's happening in the first little bit. It's, I think, 1 to 12. That's like the recap. Um, And as we continue, it's interesting to see how people respond to Jesus. We're going to start to see in John chapter 7, verse 12, there's a lot of mixed opinions about who he was. Uh, John 7, 12 says, And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, No, he's leading people astray. And in verse 20, if you jump down to that, people actually accuse him of being demon-possessed. They say, you have a demon. And so they're kind of like almost calling Jesus out. There's some people mocking him. There's some people who just don't agree with him. And then there's some people that are like, no, he's a good man. So the people in the crowd are also, they're very afraid to talk about Jesus. It's almost like they know how the, the teachers of the law, the religious leaders, are responding to him. And they're afraid of what almost like talking about Jesus will do to them. And so there's some people that are just afraid to even mention his name. They're like, I don't even know. I'm not saying the name Jesus. Like, there seems to be so many people who are just so against him. And the crowd has a lot of opposite opinions about who Jesus is. I would even go so far as to say this is probably pretty common even today. I think that Jesus has a similar effect on people in our culture. I think he, there's some people who are like, yeah, he was a good man who lived a long time ago. Cool. Some people are like, no, he was crazy. I don't even know why people follow him. And there's a lot of these differing opinions. Some people don't think he exists. Some people, there's a lot of people's opinions about who he was. Some would say he's the savior. Some expected him to do things differently. There's a lot of opinions. Some people are afraid to speak Jesus' name too loudly. Some people are afraid of what that will do to them if they speak his name too loudly. Some people are angry at him. Some people are in awe of him. Some people are skeptical of him. And that's kind of, I just want to paint a picture of what this crowd was like. There was all these different opinions, all these people who had seen some of the things that Jesus had already done, some of the healing, some of his teachings, and there's all these different opinions. And I think if you look at our world today, it's very common to see a different opinion. There's probably as many opinions as there are people in this room. (laughs) And I think that this is kind of the thing that Jesus is speaking into in this moment. 
So I want to challenge you on something today, and this is something that I challenge myself on when I read the Bible too. I challenge myself to see myself in the crowd, to see myself in the story. So don't just read it as some fairy tale that didn't actually happen. These were real people that actually spoke these words, that actually lived a long time ago. We are real people with real sin issues, and we have actually similar issues to the people in this crowd. So I don't want us to remove ourselves from the story. I want us to see ourselves in the story because we're, no one is above this, right? Nobody is, oh, I'm just, I never do these things, right? I don't want, I don't want that to be the perspective. I want us to have the humility to be able to be like, actually, yes, I, I can see times when I've done that. We're going to speak about a few different groups of people that are in the crowd that we kind of read through. As we read through John, they kind of chime in with their opinions about things. And then we'll talk about how can we actually come against those things and so that we don't become those groups of people in the crowd. But I want us to see our human tendencies and our, have the humility to kind of see ourselves in the crowd today. So the first category of people that we're going to talk about today are the people who judge Jesus based on appearances. In John chapter 7, 21 to 24, that's where we're going to pick up today. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to read along. Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the, from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So just to kind of back up, there are a couple of Jewish customs that are mentioned here. If you go and look at verse 22, it talks about the Sabbath and it talks about circumcision. So some of you guys have heard about these, but just to kind of go over it, because it's not common all the time for us, the Sabbath was considered, it was like um, a law in the Jewish uh, culture. It was a day each week when they weren't allowed to do any work. They had to keep it holy. God had actually told them to rest on the Sabbath and to keep it holy. But what had happened was the Jewish leaders had come in and imposed a bunch of extra laws on the Sabbath. So they were punished for things like walking too far on their rest day. They were punished for picking grain to eat on their rest day. They were punished for picking up their bed on the rest day. And it's just all these different things that were actually, it had become so bad that people in the Israelite culture stopped seeing the Sabbath as a day of rest and they started seeing it as a burden. It was so burdensome for the, the people. They couldn't even rest. It was actually just hard. And so when the Jewish leaders had actually come to Jesus and said, well, why did you heal this guy on the Sabbath? They weren't allowed to heal on the Sabbath even. The Pharisees came to him and said, why? Why did you do that? And Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so they had twisted what God intended them to do on the Sabbath, which was to rest. And they had made it something that actually put weight on the people, that actually burdened the people. Another custom that was mentioned there was circumcision. Not going to go into a huge amount of detail about that. If you don't know what that is, you can feel free to ask a trusted friend. I would not recommend Googling it unless you have a very strong stomach. Um, but it was the Jewish law during that time that if you had a son, if you gave birth to a son, eight days later, you had to have that son circumcised. And what Jesus is saying here is that even on the eighth day, if the eighth day falls on a Sabbath, you still do that. You know what I mean? He's like, because that's your law, you still circumcise little boys on the eighth day. How come I can't heal someone on the Sabbath? You know what I mean? Like he's confronting them with their own hypocrisy. He's saying like, this doesn't even make sense, what you guys are saying right now. And then he says, don't judge based on appearances. Use right judgment. So in other words, what seems right here? You know what I mean? Like, does it seem right to allow a man to continue to suffer just because I happen to see that he needs healing and it happens to be on our rest day? Or should I pray for him to be healed so that he can, he can be restored, so that he doesn't have to suffer anymore? You wound someone on the eighth day, that's fine, but it's not okay to make someone well on the eighth day. Use right judgment. And so 
that kind of uh, points to the next thing, which is we have this limited understanding as humans, right? I think that sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we think that we know everything. We were like, we're like, yeah, no, I've been around for a while. I've been a Christian for a while. You know, we're like, no, I have like the, I could see it. You know, I could see what that person's doing wrong. I could see what that person's doing wrong. I'm looking at them and I'm seeing all the issues. But actually in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, it says we only know in part. We don't get to see the whole picture. We only know part of it. The only person who actually sees the whole picture is who? God. And so we are part of a body for a reason. We're a part of a church for a reason. It's because everybody gets a little piece of the picture. And everybody has a perspective that they bring to the table. Sometimes we're wrong, and that's okay. But everybody gets to see something. But not everybody gets to see everything. Appearances can be deceiving. And how we expect something to look isn't always how it ends up looking, right? The Israelites people, they had this expectation of who the Savior would be, of who the Messiah would be, what he would look like, what he would do. They were like, in their minds, they had it, their imagination. They're like, when he comes, oh, that's going to be a good day. You know what I mean? When he comes, oh, we're going to be saved. There's going to be all this stuff that happens. They had all these ideas of what he would appear to be. Something I thought of from my own life that helps to illustrate this is I have these ideas. I have really, like, interesting expectations sometimes of what I can do DIY. Um, and I did a project in my house, God bless my husband, he's so supportive, um, of our living room. We painted our, this was a while back, we painted our living room when we moved into our house. I don't know why I chose the colors I did. You guys, if you're new and you haven't bought a house yet, um, little color goes a long way. A little color. Uh, I decided I wanted a dark brown wall, don't know why, and uh, light beige walls, and then I wanted an accent wall that was both colors. Both. And not only was it both colors, it was, it was beige with chocolate brown stripes going this way, and then chocolate brown stripes going this way. And in my mind, it was going to be beautiful. I was like, this wall is going to be amazing. When people walk in the house, they're going to be like, wow, your house is so nice. And between the combination of the colors that I chose and the pattern that I chose, it just ended up looking like a waffle cone. Um, and, it, and then, of course, you're done painting, and you're like, I'm not painting again. I'm done. And so it stayed like that for, like, years and years, and we just repainted it, and it's never happening again. I'm just white. I'm boring now. Um, <laughs> so Jesus didn't look like what, he, what people thought he was going to look like, right? They had this vision of what it was going to be like, and they were like, this guy cannot be the Messiah. He does not look like what we pictured. He is not doing anything to save us from our oppression. I have no idea who he thinks he is. This is not the Messiah. It also goes back to what Jesus' brothers had said about him in verse 4. He said, they said, no one who works in secret who, or sorry, no one who works in secret seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So they were like Jesus. Like, we don't understand, because up till this point, Jesus' miracles had been pretty small, like, within a smaller crowd context. Like, there had been bigger crowds, but not compared to doing something on a huge scale in Jerusalem. And he had actually been very secretive for the first part of his ministry about where he did miracles and when he did them and to who he did them with, because he knew it wasn't the right time yet. And so his brothers are like, you're not meeting our expectations. They're like, do something. Show people who you are. Make a big spectacle. Do something to show people if this is who you are, we want to see it. We want it to look how we want it to look. Jesus was not what people expected the Messiah to be. They were under so much oppression, right? And I think we can kind of maybe relate to that on maybe not quite the same level, but when you're going through something really difficult, you just want someone to come in and just take that away, right? You're like, seriously? Like, where is God right now? Like, why isn't he doing this thing that I want him to do? Why isn't he setting me free from this thing that I want him to set me free from? I'm dealing with so much right now. Doesn't he see what I'm dealing with? Doesn't he see how hard my life is? There had been a lot foretold about Jesus 
They wanted a Messiah to be the one who would defeat the Romans. They were under kind of like the Roman oppression at that time. They were being taxed so heavily that people were just in poverty. They could hardly afford to feed their families. If you were injured and you couldn't work, you were basically homeless. You were homeless if you had no one to take care of you. Ephesians 1, 20 to 21 says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. It's prophesied that Christ will rule with all authority in heaven and on earth in the present age and in the one to come. But the Israelites wanted that authority to look different. They wanted that kingdom to be an earthly one. They were like, go take over Jerusalem. You know what I mean? Like, let's get together. Let's like fight against the Romans. Let's do a physical battle right now and take back our land. Let's take back our freedom. Jesus, why won't you lead us? Like, if you're the Messiah, why aren't you leading us into that right now? But the kingdom that Jesus was setting up on earth was not the earthly kind of kingdom. He actually responds to this in John 18, which I'm sure we'll get to, uh, verse 36. It says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Many of Jesus' followers were impatient for his kingdom to be established. Even the ones who did think he was the Messiah. Even his disciples were like, all right, like, when's it going to happen, Jesus? Like, why aren't you doing what what we want you to do? We've been patient. The appearance did not match people's expectations. Acts 1, 6 to 7, this was Jesus' disciples talking to him. He said, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Jesus responds to us that it is not for us to know the time, right? He responded to the people of that day. It is not for you to know the time when this kingdom will be established because Jesus didn't come the first time to establish all of the Old Testament prophecies. He will fulfill the prophecies with his second coming, but they didn't understand that. And the fact that Jesus didn't completely defeat and confront every single enemy of Israel at that time led a lot of them to believe that he just wasn't the Messiah. He doesn't look like it. He doesn't do it. He's not doing what we thought he was going to do, so he can't be. And it led a lot to be very confused. They judged Jesus based on appearances. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the people in the crowd couldn't see Jesus because he didn't look like what they imagined him to look like. We do this sometimes, right? We expect God to come into a situation, to do things according to plan. When things don't go according to plan, we start to doubt, we start to question. We're like, Jesus, why didn't you come into the situation and do things the way that I wanted you to do things. But we don't see the whole picture and we don't understand it all. And I think that's something that's very humbling to hear sometimes, especially because we we don't see God in a physical way all the time. And so we're just like, well, I think I can see everything. I don't understand why he's not doing things the way that I want him to do things, the way I imagined it. So the second category of people that we're going to read about were misinformed people or uninformed people, I guess you could say. Misinformation. Some of them, they had the wrong information about who Jesus was and it caused them to doubt him. So we're going to read in John 7, 25 to 29. It says, Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. 
but I have not come of my own accord, but he who sent me is true, and to him, and him you do not know. And then we're going to skip down to John 7, 40 to 43. And when he heard these wor- they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? He comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was division among the people over him. So the people were convinced that because they knew where Jesus was from, right? They're like, he is from Galilee. Like, when the Messiah comes, no one's going to know where he's from. But the reality is, is these prophecies that most Israelite people knew actually said the exact opposite. They were very specific about where the, the Messiah was going to be from. But the people didn't have that information. Micah t- uh, 5 2 talks about a ruler being born in Bethlehem, one would, who would rule over all of Israel. Isaiah 11 1 says the Messiah would come from King David's family line or from the stump of Jesse. It also says Jesse was King David's father. Isaiah 7 14 says that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son whose name will be Emmanuel which means God with us. So there's all these things, all these prophecies that would point to Jesus being the Messiah, but these people, they didn't have the information. They didn't know enough about Jesus. They hadn't actually taken the time to go and talk to Jesus or anyone who knew him about where he was from, about any information about his background. He was actually born of a virgin in Bethlehem and from the family line of David. And then in verse 41, they asked the question, is the Messiah to come from Galilee? He's supposed to come from Bethlehem, right? They, they almost assumed he was born in Galilee without actually asking where he had been born, without any of the background information that, and the things that they were using to discount him, this misinformation that they had, was actually some of the strongest evidence to support that he was the Messiah. They didn't have the information. They were misinformed. They were uninformed about who Jesus actually was, and they were using things that weren't even true to disprove it, to disprove him as the Messiah. Verse 43 to 44 said that there was division among the people over him, and they wanted him arrested. They were like, you know what? There's too much confusion here. There's no peace in this. Jesus is doing this. This is not how we pictured it. I don't understand this background. This makes no sense to me. If he came from Galilee, he could not possibly be the Messiah. And there was all this division and hostility. But it also says in there, if you're going to, if you read through it, it says that nobody laid a hand on him, right? And so all these people are getting angry in the crowd. They're all angry at Jesus and they're frustrated and they're confused, but nobody touched him and he continued to keep speaking. In their misinformation about Jesus, it created hostility and division in the crowd. And I think that this is also very common in our churches today. I think that sometimes we can have information that is incorrect. We can have these things that we believe about Jesus, about the Bible, about other Christians that actually cause us to reject everything or to doubt everything. We like see something online especially. It's my least favorite thing. If you find things online, you have to be very careful because people can just put anything else out there that they want. Make sure you're always reading your own Bible because sometimes you'll, you'll see something and you'll be like, that's so wrong. How can Christians believe that? But Christians might believe that, but that's not what the Bible says. And so we have to be very careful with the things that we accept as truth the misinformation that sometimes we have can actually cause us to reject everything. Or if we're uninformed about something, we can just create our own assumptions and then we can reject everything. And this was what was happening in the crowd. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we probably all have had misinformation at times, and I think we've probably even had problems with other Christians because of that. There's probably been division in relationships, division in friendships within the church, within the community because of the same reason, because of misinformation. My favorite example of this are Christian quotes. Um, People sometimes have these things, these one-liners that they say that they think are in the Bible, and I don't know where they actually came from, but everybody thinks they're in the Bible, and they're not. And one of my favorite examples of this is I hear people say this all the time, like, God wants me to be happy. And then they'll go forward and do something not great. Um, This is what we call a half-truth. 
It's not that Jesus doesn't want us to be happy. It's not that God doesn't want us to be happy. He wants us to have joy. Absolutely. Psalm 1611 says that in his presence there is fullness of joy. Right? That means there's joy we can't explain. When you're with God, when you're in his presence, there's this fullness of joy. You're overflowing. But then you have to look at the other side of it because James 1, 2 says that we should be joyful in trials. Right? That means that our joy doesn't come from our external circumstances. It doesn't have to come from what happens to us, what's happening outside of us, what's happened around us. It only has to come from inside of us, from Jesus. And so people often will say this, like, God wants me to be happy, and then they'll go forward and make destructive choices out of wanting to get their own happiness. And it's true that Jesus wants us to have joy, that God wants us to have joy, but he's more concerned with our holiness than our happiness. And the reason why is because your holiness will lead to future happiness, whereas giving in to temporary things that will gratify you in the moment will not. An example of this is nobody ever loves cardio. If you love cardio, don't even put your hand up. I don't want to know. But if you're doing cardio, you're miserable, and you're in it, And you're like, this sucks. I don't want to do this. But then later, you're like, I feel great. I'm like, my my body feels good. I'm healthy. I'm strong. I'm able to do things. Another example is with budgeting. Nobody loves sticking to their budget all the time. Sometimes you just want to do something that costs more money than you have. Sometimes you just want to buy something that costs more money than you have. But then later, what happens? You're like, oh, I don't have any money for food. (laughs) my fridge is empty, my car is empty, I'm hungry, (laughs) and you don't have what you need in that moment to bring sustainable, to bring sustainability to your body. And so it's making those temporary decisions that actually leads to future unhappiness sometimes. So if people aren't super happy in the moment and they use that, that can actually lead to maybe in the moment they're like, I'm really, I feel good now. I got the thing I wanted. But then later it might lead to something that you don't actually, it doesn't actually make you happy. God is a perfect father, which means he loves to give us good gifts, but he will never give you something at the expense of your character. Are we misinformed or uninformed about who Jesus is? And what are some of those misinformed beliefs that we might have? Because we all have them. It's not like any of us understands completely the whole Bible, knows everything that God has ever said, and just completely understands it. What are those beliefs that have led us to reject or doubt God? We don't have to know everything, but we do have to do our part to try to understand and to try to learn so that we can kind of come against those misinformed beliefs that we might have. The third group of people were those who rejected Jesus because of their own pride. We're going to read in John 7, 45 to 52. It says, The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, and who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever has spoken like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, who does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to him, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So, The Jewish leaders, the reason Jesus didn't make that grand entrance into the Feast of Booths is because he didn't want these people to take him into custody, right? These are the people who they've been looking for a chance to arrest Jesus. Jesus mostly spent a lot of time outside of the major cities because he didn't want to be arrested at that that point in time. That's why he taught on the hillsides. He went into the small cities and he did miracles there. And then he left quickly afterwards, and he was traveling around. It was because he was trying to do these things, and he didn't want these people to get in the way of that. And so these people, they see their opportunity. Jesus is preaching in the temple, and they're just like, go get him. Sent, they sent some guards. They're like, go get him and bring him in. The guards came back empty-handed. They were like, and he's like, where, they're like, where is he? Why didn't you bring him in? 
And the guards had been so amazed by what Jesus was teaching. They were like, you wouldn't believe the way this guy is preaching. You wouldn't believe some of the things he's saying. No one has ever spoken like this guy. So they're just like completely impacted by Jesus. And they tell the, the teachers of the law about this. And the Jewish leaders were like, common people. No one could understand scripture like us. You guys are just guards. That's just a crowd of common people. They don't know the law. They don't know the scripture. Makes me feel icky talking like that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but they did. They thought themselves above the common people. They couldn't understand how some people who didn't know anything compared to them could come to them and say, this guy's got it. He has something. He understands something that we don't understand. And the Pharisees were like, no, we're the standard. No, we know the law. We know the scripture. If we don't believe in him, then what reason do you have to believe in him? He hasn't deceived us. We're the standard, right? Like, look at me. I'm not over there believing in him, falling at his feet. Why would you think that he's the Messiah? Why would you think he's anything special? But in their arrogance, they made some mistakes. There's Nicodemus. Do you guys remember Nicodemus? We've talked about him throughout this series already. I kind of like to see Nicodemus as like the secret follower of Jesus. He was like kind of like a closet Christian, but he had actually had a very like deep impacting moment with Jesus up on the rooftop, if you guys remember. And now he was still in the religious leaders. He was still with the Pharisees, but he believed Jesus was who he said he was. And so he stands up for Jesus in this moment, and he's just like, we have to at least give him a proper hearing. You can't just like take this guy in and sentence him. You know nothing about him. You don't know what he's doing. But the Pharisees took that as kind of a confrontation of their authority, even though it came from one of their own. They were like, who do you think you are? Are you from Galilee too? You know, like, are you guys buddies? And then he's like, look for yourself. No prophets come from Galilee. So the reason that the Pharisees said this again was because of their own pride. They thought of themselves as above people from Galilee. They thought of themselves as above the common people. And they thought nothing good could come from Galilee. The problem was is that, first of all, Jesus wasn't even born in Galilee. Yes, he was raised there, but he was born in Bethlehem, which was in Judea. And the second problem, second thing that they said was, no prophets come from Galilee but they must have actually forgotten that there was five Old Testament prophets that came from Galilee. <laughs> Jonah, Nahum, Hosea, Elijah, and Elisha. And so in that moment, their pride overshadowed their common sense. They couldn't even see the truth in that moment because of their own arrogance. They were like forgetting everything that they had ever learned because they had been in school for years and years and years to learn the entire Torah. And they still forgot about these little facts because they were so prideful. They thought they were better than the guards, the crowd, and anyone who would believe Jesus was anything special. In John uh, 7, 49, they said, this crowd that knows not the law is accursed. In other words, we know the law. This crowd knows nothing. They don't know what they're talking about. And nothing good could possibly come from someone who isn't one of us. The Pharisees shamed and intimidated people who would come against them, who would say anything that they disagreed with. But in contrast, this is what I, what I meant when I said Jesus came to stir up the waters. Jesus didn't do that. He got down to people's level. He spoke to people on the same level. He, went, he didn't care if they were smart enough, if they're, what their race was. He didn't care what their gender was. He didn't care how rich they were. He went to where the people were. He talked to everybody as if they were the same. And this was not okay with the Pharisees. They were like, who does this guy think he is? He's just a nobody talking to nobodies. But he spoke to everyone on the same level. And in, in fact, he actually lowered himself to their level because he was above them, right? He was the only one that was above them. But he chose to go down to their level to speak to them because he wanted them to hear him. He wanted them to know how loved they were. 
And so this is probably the hardest question you might have to ask yourself today. Is this you? Are you in this group of people in the crowd? Have you, I think we all have been, maybe we all slip into that once in a while, get caught up into how long I've been a Christian. How many years have you been a Christian? Oh, only two? Hmm. I know all this stuff because I've been reading my Bible for a really long time. You know what I mean? And we kind of get caught up in how much I know and how right I am. I can't even look at the comment section on any video on YouTube anymore <laughs> or on anything. Like if I'm watching a sermon, I don't look at the comments because I'm just like, I don't want to know all the opinions of the crowd right now. I just want to hear the sermon. But I think sometimes we get so caught up in our knowledge and our understanding and how much we know and how much better we are. Oh, I'm a pastor. I've been studying this long. Oh, I'm this and I've been doing this. And I'm right. And our ability to be right becomes more important than loving people. Jesus was always right. He was never wrong. But yet he put loving people above condemning people. He never condemned people. And we get caught up in this sometimes and we dismiss people that might come from a different background or might have a different perspective or might not understand things the way that we do, but sometimes they bring something new to the table that we don't have because of things that they've experienced that we haven't experienced. But what the Pharisees did here is they missed an opportunity because they were too proud. They missed an opportunity to partner with Christ in his mission on earth. They didn't go with Jesus and say, you know what, actually I'm wrong here. We have been doing things wrong for a really long time. I've been in a pattern that is not healthy, that is not okay. I've been treating people badly. I'm sorry, Jesus, I'm sorry. They did not do that. They said, no, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm right. And in their pride, they were walking in the opposite direction of Jesus. Jesus was like, we're going this way now. Anyone who wants to, follow me. The Pharisees were like, no. I'm going to directly oppose that. I'm going to say, no, that is not how we do things. And in their pride, they missed out on that opportunity of being a part of what Christ was there to do. In our pride, it's crazy to me. We can actually be walking the opposite direction of Jesus. We can be like, I'm a Christ follower. I'm a Christian. But when we start to get proud, we actually turn the other way. And we're like not following Christ anymore. I don't know what we're following. But that's not who Jesus is. When we get caught up in what we think and what we know and how much better we are, we actually turn away. And we start walking in the opposite direction that Christ is walking in. We ignore the people that Christ wants us to minister to. We don't pray for the people that he wants us to pray for. And this isn't to keep us stuck in shame. Everybody sins. Everybody has pride. Nobody has to be ashamed of that here. If you have pride, put your hand up. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Everyone who didn't has pride. Um, so everybody has it. It's a thing. We all deal with it. And so we don't have to be like, no, that's not me. Like, we all have it. It's not, it might not look the same every time. We all have it. But the, the amazing thing is, is that if any of those religious leaders in that moment had said to Jesus, if they had been like, I'm so sorry. I can see now I'm doing it. I've been doing it wrong. Please, like, humble my heart. I want to follow you. Jesus would 100,000 million percent have done it. He would have been like, let's go. Like, I'm so happy you saw that. I'm so happy but the reason he responded, Jesus responded with so much hostility towards these leaders is because of their hardness of their hearts, not because of their sin. It was because he's like, this is your sin. They were like, no, it's not. You know what I mean? Just accept it. We sin. We're not always right. We do have pride. And then ask Jesus to help us with our pride. And it isn't comfortable. It's never fun to look at ourselves and be like, this sucks about me. Nobody likes to do that, and it's not to get stuck in condemnation, but I believe that what Jesus is trying to do here when he's stirring up the waters, he's saying, here's the issue. 
now let's go. Let's not do this anymore. You know what I mean? He's not saying, oh, now feel really bad about yourself for the rest of your life. He's saying, here's the issue. Now that you're aware of it, let's go. Let's move on. Let's pray for some humility. So the three groups of people in the crowd that we see are those who couldn't see Jesus because they were judging by appearance, those who couldn't see him because they were misinformed, and those who couldn't see him because they were prideful. And Jesus spoke to them all the same. So as I close today, I'm just going to call the worship team up. You might be asking yourself the question, so why did Jesus do that then? (laughs) Why did he risk going into the city of Jerusalem when he could have potentially been arrested, standing up in this giant crowd of people, speaking to all of them when he knew, he was God, he knew, that there was going to be hostility from all of these crowds of people, that these people would doubt him, that they would reject him, that they would be too proud to accept him, that they would be misinformed about him. Why did he do it? And the answer is actually like found in a super small verse that's really easy to miss. In John chapter 7, 31, it says, Yet many of the people believed in him, and they said, When the Christ appears, will he do more than this man has done? The fourth group of people in the crowd were the ones who just believed. They were in the same boat as everyone else. They were nothing special. They weren't like superhumans that could just see everything and knew everything. They had just seen what Jesus had done, the miracles that he had performed, the healing that he had done, and the teaching. And they were amazed. They were like, nobody, like, if there's a Messiah still coming, I have no idea what he could do that would be more than what this guy was doing. He has to be the Messiah. He has to be the Savior. Because he, look at what he's done. Look at everything. Look at the evidence. And they just believed in him. There was this humility in them. They were so humbled by what they had seen Jesus do that they just believed and followed him. And Jesus spoke to everyone on this, like at the same level, the same, they were all in the same boat. But he came for the ones that were open, that were humble. Because everyone who rejected him, they had already made up their mind. He loved them. He wanted them to follow him. But they had made up their mind about him. And maybe their mind will change down the road. We don't know. But the group of people that just believed, they accepted Jesus for who he said he was in that moment. They found him because their hearts were humble. And Jesus will be found by people with humble hearts who are truly seeking him. We might not always understand In fact, we never probably ever will understand. Maybe in heaven he'll show us, I don't know. We might not always see how he's working. We may not know everything, but we can trust him. And the reason that we can trust him is because he's shown himself to be trustworthy again and again and again. Not just in scripture, but I think in each and every single one of our lives, we can look at a time where we were like, God really, really was faithful. He's always been faithful. Even in the hard times, he's been faithful. He's been there. I have never been without him. He's always been there. We can learn more about Jesus by reading his word and allowing that to come in and bring change in our lives, to bring transformation in our hearts. And there's going to be times, I'm just going to, spoiler alert, where you'll find yourself slipping into the other groups again. Sometimes you might catch yourself being like, I don't think that's actually in the Bible. I don't know where I got that from. I'm going to look in there and see what the Bible actually says. Or you might find yourself looking at someone and being like, oh, what does that person think they're saying? Maybe you're doing that right now. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with admitting that and being like, I have pride right now, God. I, I can tell that that is pride. And I don't want that to be in the way. I don't want that to stop me from going the direction you want me to go. I don't want that to blind me from seeing the things that you want me to see. And I think that in the same way that Jesus was stirring up the waters in the New Testament church, he was doing things differently. I think he wants that for us too. I don't think he likes when we just get into patterns of doing things over and over and over and over and over again. And it means nothing to us. 
And so I think that in this moment, he wants us to take a look inside of us and be like, what is it that needs to be changed? What is it that needs to be stirred up in me? What do I need to let go of? What do I need to stop doing so that I can walk in the same direction as Jesus? And I don't know about you guys, but I really don't want to be walking in the opposite direction of Jesus. I want to be walking with him. I think that's why we're here today. We want to know how to walk with Jesus. We want to know what it looks like to really follow him. And so if there's things that are getting in the way, I don't care how bad that makes me look. Like if there's issues that I need to work on, tell me. Because I want those things out of the way. I want to be able to see clearly where I'm supposed to be going with Jesus. I don't want to be like, I'm right. Blinders on. I don't want to see a perspective outside of my own. That's why we have each other. And of course, it's always done in love and with someone you have relationship with and with someone who knows you. But at the same time, we should be willing to take that so that we can walk with Jesus and so that we don't have to walk in the opposite direction. Conviction is a good thing if it tears down the barriers between you and God. If it is keeping you if your sin is keeping you from walking with Jesus, you want that out of the way. So don't leave here today without something real to work on, okay? We don't like the word repent, but it's a good word because repent means to turn away from sin and turn towards Jesus. And so if there's something that you need to ask for forgiveness for, do that because Jesus wants that out of the way so that you can truly see where he wants you to go. And Romans 8.1 says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if there is anything in you that feels condemned, rebuke that in Jesus' name because that's not from God. Conviction is from God. Conviction gets us to turn in the opposite direction, but then we get forgiveness and we move on. So if there's something that you need to repent of, that you need to ask for forgiveness for, do that and then understand that you have been forgiven, that it is in your past. It is not who you are anymore. And so as we go today, I'm just going to pray. Um, and I just hope that as we close in worship with this last song, that you guys will just spend a little bit of time in prayer and ask God, what is it about today that I can work on? Is there something from today's sermon in my own life that I need to work on, that I need to repent of, that I need forgiveness for? And then just come to God. He's not going to reject you. He's not going to turn away from you. He's not going to slap you on the wrist. He's going to forgive you. And so just as we close in worship and as we close in prayer, I just, I ask that you guys would just take that minute and just spend a little bit of time talking to God and just ask him, what is that thing? What is the thing that's between me and you that I could start working on today? God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your church. We thank you that you had something for each of us today, God, that you desired to speak to each of us today, that you desired, um, to know each of us more and that you want a closeness and an intimacy with each person here, God. And so right now, I just pray for each heart that is in this place. We pray that you would open our hearts to hear from your Holy Spirit today as we worship, that you would help us to not feel that condemnation, God. Condemnation, we just rebuke you in Jesus' name. But we ask that the Holy Spirit's conviction would come in, God, and that that would draw us to repentance but that every person here who prays, Lord God, that they would know that they are forgiven and that they would know that you love them and that there would be a peace and an understanding of who you are and how much you love your church and how much you want a connection with them. And so we pray for these things today, God, and we ask that you would just be with each person as we leave, that you give each person um, grace and peace and that you'd be glorified through our lives. 